Federica, great job uh, curating. Yeah. It's been an awesome week. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Very good with this. Yeah. Very nice. You I gotta go over to Twitter and check out. I gotta check that out with you <laughs> doing Federica. I yeah. I got rid of my Twitter account, like I told you, but yeah, yeah. I uh, I do go and kind of creep around Twitter sometimes. Right. <laughs> you can do this stuff on there yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a mixture. There's some great oh, stuff, sure. and then there's like the cesspool. You kind of have. Oh to yeah, like, yeah. There's some dark sometimes corners. Sometimes you're curious <laughs> what's going on in the cesspool. You know, I, yeah. I kind of <laughs> you peek in. You know, the arguments get yourself, people get yeah. in. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah what, what What were you looking at though? Was there something specific on Twitter that you guys were talking about? I kind of joined a little. Well, I didn't join late. Like maybe thirty seconds late. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've tried to yeah Federica's uh, curating some yeah some oh. our stuff so. yeah yeah oh, our okay. ladies oh, cool. has a yeah, like yeah. a curation account like a rotating series of curators oh, and so okay, yeah. oh nice people okay. take over for a week that was it's I did it uh I think like two years ago it was, it's a lot of fun <laughs> so what yeah. so what's the what's the account what's the account our ladies we, right we are yeah, we are ladies. our ladies, our ladies. I, I'll send it oh over. we are our ladies okay i'll check it out i have a lot of uh, our people that yeah. I follow on twitter so i'll add that one for sure you know i do yeah. think i remember seeing your face federica on the on the on that account um it, don't they oh change my. it or did, was it just a post with your your face yeah i oh, saw a couple of they, posts they, they, they yeah. changed the yeah. photo uh, for uh -huh. the person yeah yeah, yeah. It's the, that, oh there she the, is yeah oh i see her yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's the procedure uh in fact yes uh it's quite an honor you know a commitment so yeah i like it i like it because i found many things that i didn't expect it because i was searching to put something interesting so yeah. while searching i found things that i didn't expect it so that's cool if you, if you if you have if you i don't know i have something to share just let me know i have uh today and tomorrow left oh okay you're still there for a couple of days so we have a, an inside uh, track okay <laughs> when i hype things all right yeah. okay well i think we got well we have the five of us here so that's good and i had volunteered to uh present today chapter so nine <laughs> chapter nine so i'll go ahead and share um and there's federica as we were talking about <laughs> so the chapter we were looking at was chapter nine judging ball effectiveness so i looked at what was in the github repo and and i looked at the uh chapter of course um and we could kind of just go over some of the key points so this one's about, as they said, uh, telling whether your model works well. Uh, the first point that they get at is even if you're using your model for inference versus prediction, it's actually very important to make sure that your model actually does fit the data, uh, which you know seems intuitively to make sense. Um, in the book, uh, Regression and Other Stories, that's a, a theme that they keep returning to. Uh, that book is largely about more of an inference side of modeling, but, but he kind of hammers home again and again, they hammer home that, you know, when you have a model, you want to make sure that your model is a pretty good representation of the mechanism that you're trying to model. So don't be a, a stargazer, as they say, looking for those uh, <laughs> you know, low p-values with the stars and just deciding you're done, you're done for the day. So that's kind of the, the message there. Now, tidy models is great because, you know, as with everything else in tidy models, it gives you just a wealth of different uh, choices as, as far as how you might evaluate your model. So let's go back to the thing that the class put together, previous classes. Oh, and then there's this disclaimer too, um, which I, I, I think was good. Um, it's like these examples are to demonstrate metric evaluation, not good data science. So, you know, don't try this at home. And, you know, they make the point that it's important that you only want to use your test set once. Because if you're using your test set and you just keep using it again and again, you're, you're essentially fitting your model to the test set, which you don't want to do. 
Uh, so, so the whole point of this chapter is, yeah, yeah, okay, so again, you can only use your test data once, otherwise you're overfitting. Um, yeah, don't be a stargazer, exactly, <laughs> McElroy. And use the right criteria to judge your model. Uh, so the cl the classic example of that is if you if you have a spam filter, you know, and you say it's a hundred, you know, or I I, I goofed this up. I should have said 99 percent accurate. So it's like let's say you only have one percent of your mail is spam, and so your spam filter says nothing is spam. <laughs> you still have super high accuracy. So that's probably not the criteria that you want to use. Um, so we have our sample code that was in the repository and the people that kind of came before us did a, did a couple of approaches. So they took the AIMS data and they did a formula based on these features and they did linear regression. And they did a couple of fancy things that, that personally I had to look up to understand what they were doing. So um, they were tuning based on the penalty and the mixture. So the penalty we talked about previously, that's your uh, regularization. And then I believe the mixture has to do with how much is lasso and how much is ridge. Um, so that's what that's telling us. Uh, Oh, okay. This was a note to myself. Why did it blow up? So I fixed that. That's good. Um, I just reinstalled a bunch of stuff. So for the linear regression, you know, they tried just a whole slew of different metrics. And again, there was something that I, I personally had to look up grid, grid Latin hypercube. Didn't know what that was. So what that one is, from what I've read, it's if you randomly sample points in your space, rather than just doing a regular grid going, you know, one, two, three, four, you just, in each of those sections, you take a random sample. And then that, you know, the idea is that hopefully that gives you better coverage of the space. So they go through, um, and then this kind of illustrates, you know, how you set up such a problem, do some fancy things here where, you know, for each of the metrics, they use some per magic, if, if you are all per fans, um, and they will take the metric name. So as they go down through, they call the uh, select best model, Ames tune using this. And then they do finalize workflow and fit. After they do the fit, they get the predictions by doing the you know, map fit best, line columns, and then they unnest because they have, you know, for each of the metrics, they have a nested data set and, and a, you know, process they've done. And then at the end, we get these wonderful plots. So when I look at these plots, I um, first think, well, we get this same result <laughs> for almost everything. So I, I don't know if that was maybe what they were trying to say was that, yeah, you know, a lot of times maybe it does not make a huge difference. Um, but we do see where they use MPE, um, you know, they're definitely getting a different result. So that's that's an area where maybe, you know, that was probably not a great choice. All these other ones, though, we get pretty much a similar situation. Um, any questions or thoughts or elaborations so oh, far? Sorry, I was muted. Um, I, uh, then when you go back to to the book, you see that uh, there may be some, some difference uh, from, from the notes that they, uh, the other uh, book uh, course, uh, did because um, here I don't uh, actually uh, remember uh, a list of uh, metrics. Uh, sorry, um, metrics uh, to uh, to do these things because. Um, 
que, do, do, you, do you recall where, where, where it was in the, in the book, in the chapter? Oh, this was just in the repository ah, that okay. I pulled down. Yeah. 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 Because so they, I used that they did like, yeah. It's kind of a starting point. Now, yeah, it, if you look at the book itself, it kind of, yeah, it kind of elaborates more on, on the steps. No, that that that's interesting, but I say I, I want to say that that that's an addition to to the chapter. Right. Because, uh, uh, yeah, you can you can find it in the in there, and so they did like a sort of case study with that uh, type of data. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that that was interesting because you have uh, uh, they tried a list of metrics in um, just. Here. Yeah, this is um, uh, in the book itself. I feel like yeah, they did a you know good job of just going through a specific example. So yeah, you say you know I'm going to do my fit, and I'm going to get my results from my prediction. But then I have my prediction and my actual. So then when you have that, then you can do you know the plots. And you can do things like, yeah, I went to see the root mean squared error. And you see what the result would be. So, and then it, yeah, and then it also shows how, you know, you don't have to just choose one. You can actually do several if you wish. Um, so, okay, so that's regression metrics. So then you get to binary classification, which are also fun. Um, and, you know, we all know the great uh, confusion matrix where you see, you know, how many true positives, false positives you have. Uh, so here, you know, generally you hope to see everything on the diagonal or most things on the diagonal. Um, you can, you know, use your various metrics. You have accuracy that we've discussed, which can be good and sometimes not so good. <laughs> it all really depends on your, your data. Um, Matthew's correlation coefficient is, is perhaps a more robust matrix. Uh, we know the F1 metric, which uh, tries to balance out the uh, sensitivity and the specificity, if, or the precision recall, sorry. Yeah, um, I think uh, this, this bit here is something that they, uh, they add. They added? Afterwards. Oh, is this like new? From last time you went through? Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah, I, I um, just am reading this for the first time. Does anybody, um, does anybody know what Matthew's correlation coefficient is? I mean, I do a lot of like forecast I, accuracy stuff with my jobs. So yeah, I've um, never heard of that. And I'm, I'm actually. Honestly, I, I'll say, Laura, I, I was not familiar with that either. That was a new one to me. Um, so I, yeah, you can see I've already been there. Um, so let's see, what does it say? So they say it's related to the chi-squared statistic for two by okay. two contingency. So if you're, we're all kind of familiar with that probably. Um, so yeah, so it, it appears the correlation coefficient for two binary variables will return the phi coefficient. And then it, it gives you, yeah, the actual formula right here. So it's related to the point. So this one, honestly, I don't know this one. It's like um, a, dot, a scaler product, <laughs> it looks like, or something. If I'm understanding yeah. that notation correctly, yeah, interesting. Okay, I uh, I had never heard of it, but it's yeah. Oh, and so it talks about in machine learning. Um, yeah, there's no perfect way of describing a confusion matrix by a single number. Oh, this is nice to know. The Matthews correlation coefficient is regarded as being one of the best such measures. So, so I mean, if we're presenting results of our model, and I've done this, uh, you know, you present the confusion matrix, and then hopefully that gives people some intuitive sense of how well you did. But if you just, you know, if you just want a number, and it looks like this is probably the one to choose. Um, so it goes into, yeah, more and more uh, math goodness. That you can get into as, as much or as little as you wish. So yeah, so that was a that was an interesting thing that that I learned. Honestly, um, yeah, and I, I appreciate the people that went through this before put together this uh, our markdown file because it did uh, certainly introduce me to some new things. 
So for the binary classification, they went through kind of the same exercise. Um, in this case, uh, and, and another thing that's kind of good to note about what they did, um, you know, they were doing the cross fold validation rather than doing the thing of, oh, let's look at look at the test set. <laughs> so, so, you know, that was that was a proper way to do it. You know, use your use your cross validation, only use your validation data. Um, so, so then they did a, the similar thing. So since they're using a random forest, they have these hyperparameters that they tune the, uh, you know, how many uh, features do you include and how many trees, uh, minimum number of uh, items to have your own node, if I recall correctly. And then you create your workflow. So you add your recipe. Recipe is nice and simple because uh, Random Forest is very robust and handles categorical data and all that good stuff. Um, so then they did a tune grid here. They just did grid regular. So that's just your plain old, you know, you know, steps over the grid in the space. And they had just a, a ton of uh, metrics that I had known about and did not know about. So the co yeah, so again, they do the stuff with the per, the mapping based on your tuning to get the best. So then based on the best, they do the fit. Based on that, they put together the, you know, the data frame that will tell you uh, the predicted and the actual. And then they plot. I, I had a tricky time with this because you'll notice they actually just include a image and it was a little tricky for me to get this to render nicely. Um, but and, uh, yeah, so again, you see there's this sort of scenario where when you look at this set, it doesn't seem like there's really a radical difference in terms of what kind of results they got. You can see some that seem to have worked out better than others. So I, you could kind of say, you know, so recall, we've got a lot that are kind of off the diagonal and then specificity, how many, you know, of the negative ones we, we correctly classified as negative. Um, so that one seems maybe a little better, uh, but everything's kind of in the ballpark. So based on that, I was kind of wondering if, Oh, this is interesting though. So, so this is like one where, yeah, it seems like we've got really great results, you know, indicating that maybe this is a good thing to certainly keep in your toolkit. Um, how many positive predictions were correct out of all the predictions? And I think for things like this, it a lot of times depends on, you know, what, what's the nature of your data and, and what is most important to you? Or is it most important to find those positives? Uh, do you want, yeah, because I mean, it might be something where you have a class imbalance, so there's very few positives and, and, and you really want the power to detect those or, you know, is, is something else at play. Um, the way they chopped up the data, it's kind of balanced, so you don't really have the issue with, you know, there's more positives than negatives. So just for the heck of it, I said, <laughs> what, what if, you know, so, so the way they divide the data, they said, is the house under budget or over budget? So I said, well, what if we just say we we are not having a very high budget? So we have a pretty low budget, real low budget, <laughs> actually. So we have very few um, positives and lots of negatives. And so I just I ran this again to kind of see, you know, what would that look like? Um, and like I said, I had a little bit of difficulty getting an image out of that, but I ended up just exporting it and I'll pull that up real quick to show everyone. If I can get, hello. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see, it's probably the last one I did. Okay. Um, well, I, okay, I'll, I'll ask, can you read these numbers? Cause they're kind of dark. Yeah, barely if I squint. Okay, at right, a yeah, bit. let me see, because I, I believe I did another one where, oops. Oh, there you go. Light text. Uh, yeah, that looks. Yeah, but I still don't like the. Sorry. It's a little bit crowded. <laughs> yeah. It's that part of data science, getting the thing to look right. 
<laughs> nobody, nobody tells you that in school, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, tweet okay, great. We got numbers, but how do, how do we get them to people? So, yeah. Um, so, I feel like this did end up with a little bit more variation in, in what kind of results you saw. Um, although I was kind of a little surprised, to be honest, because, because again, there's very few um, positives by design. Um, but even this one where it's like saying, how many observations of negative have we classified as negative? You know, well, they're almost all negative. <laughs> so, but it still, it still seems like we got, you know, a better accuracy because there's so few off diagonal. I was, I was kind of surprised. Um, this one does make sense because again, it's focusing on precision. How many um, predicted as positive are in fact positive. So yeah, that's one where you would expect that worked out very nicely. Um, and then there's metrics. Okay, we talked about you know the correlation coefficient, which kind of ends up with a lot of false negatives, it feels like. And you know, some of this is probably just a, a due to sampling. So you might run this again and, and get different results. But I feel like you know it was kind of interesting just to run it and see, you know, can we see some variation between all these different metrics. Um, I feel like none of them turn out to be particularly bad. And that's probably, you know, a result of doing the tuning and the cross validation, but it does seem like some are better than others. That's kind of what I drew from there. So like this one, a uh, positive predictive value, which ag again, intuitively makes sense. How many predicted as positive are in fact positive? I didn't even have any, um, you know, false positives on, on that one. So that was interesting. So that was kind of the, the topic. The topic was, you know, how do we evaluate? What kind of tools do we have? What kind of measures? And the answer is all the measures. <laughs> so the question that, you know, that then came up was, which should we use? And, um, you know, we kind of illustrated with a couple examples, uh, things we might use. Uh, let's see. Now in the book, they talked about the, the ROC curve, which was you know, also interesting to, to take a look at, can be a good way to evaluate. And again, this one's also nice and visual. And, and they talked about in the book, which is interesting. So like a lot of these classification for multi-class, I mean, there's, there's a binary version that's intuitive, you know, just true positive, false positive, et cetera. But then, you know, how do you generalize if you have multiple classes? And, and they do go into that. They say, you know, there are generalizations and there's different ways to do it. So you could say, you know, one versus all. So for each of the classes, you say, is it in that class? Is it not? Um, and then you can either, you know, do it for everything and then average it, or you could do that, but weigh it by the number of samples. So you get some sense of, you know, the importance of that class, or you can do this approach, micro-averaging, where you have each class contribution, and then you just aggregate it all together and get a single metric. So, you can go into that as deep as you want, or you can just say, okay, cool. <laughs> we have a way to do multi-class classification. And then they do actually, you know, say you can, you know, choose which of these you want to do. And like I said, they, you end up with a, a pretty nice visual representation of, of what you tried to do for the different classes. So, you know, how well does it predict F? How well does it predict L? M and VF, you can see how it performs. Um, so yeah, so from that, they, they go to the summary. They just say it, it's, the, you know, the yardstick is our go-to package for effectiveness. And it's based on data frames, which we all love because we're diverse people, or at least I am. Uh, <laughs> there are a variety of metrics and within these, uh, sometimes they're different estimators. And then they had a couple of nice references at the end, including one by Max Kuhn. So that's probably definitely worth having a look at and seeing what that one is about. Um, so that's kind of really all I sort of had prepared. Uh, any thoughts or 
comments or questions or this this might be too much of a basic question and maybe this isn't even the right group but how the hell do you decide which <laughs> which metric to use or well it looks that's like a good question i don't I'm think it's a bad running. question I'm yeah. still running one of the models like it's I didn't process it beforehand, but like the original one where we 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 had all the RMSE and the yeah, R yeah. like uh, how do you know what's best? <laughs> like, um, I feel like yeah, the, the classic kind of um consultant answer is it depends. Uh, so yeah, that's what that's the case. Um I think I think in terms of what does it depend on, it like I said. It depends on, you know, what is it you're trying to answer? I mean, is it something where you're trying to really find a needle in a haystack situation? So you're really, really interested in, in, in picking out those positives? That, that could be an issue. Um, Laura's probably familiar with, um, you know, these various... Metrics. Not as much of the binary stuff because most of what I do is right. uh, continuous for like, forecasting. So it's, you know, theoretically could be any number um, right yeah it's actually, greater than what, zero or greater than or equal to zero right yeah that's actually, that's actually where i was going because yeah and and i've you know been a little bit in the forecasting world too so a thing that you run into there um oh here we go dun, dun, dun. regression metrics so so there you know and you've probably seen as well there's all this discussion about you know, should you use MAPE? <laughs> should you use MAPE? Should you use MACE? And, and you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where I guess if you have a problem, it's, it's probably worth kind of looking into the literature a little bit. You know, if you're doing a forecasting problem, you can read some of the stuff Heinemann wrote. Um, and if I remember correctly, Hyman is a big proponent. Of, yeah, I think of he space. created he created that metric. He created it, I, so yeah, so he's kind of close to it, right? So what? So so, so yeah. even simpler question: What is that? I've oh, what is that? Um, like most of these acronyms below the first three or four, I've never even. Yeah, heard of. no, I, um, I, I'm you know I I was gonna say I I a lot of these were new to me. So um, root mean, squared errors, RMSC, but that one. of course is scale dependent. But I like it for looking. Sometimes you can look at between models, right? And so right. It, it, the same data but different models. Um, yeah, May, yeah. MAE is um, mean absolute error. R squared, right. of course, and R squared uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that. Mean percent error, that's just percent. MAPE um, absolute is mean yeah. absolute percent error. They don't have weighted, weighted MAPE is what I, we use in my company, um, oh, okay. volume weighted. That's not really yeah. here. MACE is nice because I find like if I'm looking at and this is just like on training data. I'm not, I, I try to do time series cross validation in a shiny app. And let me tell mm -hmm. you, it takes a long time to yeah, calculate. Yeah. So, but um, MACE is really nice just for a quick look at like, mm -hmm. oh, and MACE is actually comparing, um, it's comparing the accuracy to a naive model. So yeah. that's kind of like the, the scale independence, if I remember correctly. And it's between, I, I it can, believe oh, that's, it's, yeah, what it is, yeah. if, I, if I remember correctly, yeah. And if it's over one, your your model is worse than the uh, naive model. If it's under one, obviously the closer it is to zero, the better you better are. Is, yeah, yeah. Which is really good to know because yeah, as they as they say, um, you know, if you get a model and and you pr you present some metric where it sounds good, but the reality is it's you know not that good. <laughs> that's that's not a good thing. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and I do like how they, you know, they did kind of say, you know, when would you use it? So when you can't afford a big error, because your big errors are penalized more. But then here, yeah, they're, you know, not exponentially considered worse. I know there's some controversy around like MAPE and SMAPE because they behave differently for, you know, small values and large values. So yeah, I think that's why Heinemann didn't like those. Um, but again, if you have mace, you could just say, I'm better than naive. Uh, this one, I'll, I'll be honest, no idea. Never heard of it. <laughs> I have not heard of that either. CCC. Um, I, I feel like yeah. I need to go through and read this chapter again, especially if I'm going to, you know, because there's a lot right. of interesting stuff here. 
Right. Oh, and um, so yeah, look so at accuracy that, wise. So that actually, yeah, that's a good point as well. There was um, in references binary classification and regression. Yeah. So so these references are, are very nice because so ones from H two O AI and they do talk about them at greater length. So I, I was looking at this last night. So this is this is helpful if anybody's interested in wanting to know more. Yeah, I would also, uh, yeah, this is, yeah. Uh, that is great. I might have to check that out. I, um, if anybody does time series stuff, Rob mm -hmm. Hinman, I guess that's how you pronounce his name. His, his blog is really great. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I can't recommend it enough. Um, he has a lot of presentations and his papers, a lot of them he makes available for free. To, you don't have to like, you know, buy it from a journal, but not yeah, really a tidy models awesome. thing per se, but I think it's a good way to learn about a lot of this stuff too. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so I, I feel like, yeah, if, if you want to learn more, um, and you know, I kind of have, have an intention to go back and dig a little deeper into all this too. Yeah, so symmetric. Oh, symmetric. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was like, what is SMAPE? And then I was, yeah, that's where you Maybe. use the average of yeah. the forecast and demand. Right. I, see, I don't know. I feel like, um, this kind of acts weird as you yeah, get, yeah, I don't the, know. The I did that, really but then big, so it yeah. can kind of give you uh I feel like you should wait by demand. That's just mm -hmm. my opinion, because otherwise no, you Laura, can I have totally, I would kind of totally agree. To, yeah. to, Especially, uh, you know, under you know, I guess it would yeah. be you can incentive to under forecast because you'll be penalized mm -hmm. less heavily that yeah. way. But and your your situation is probably like ours, or I don't know. I guess I don't know what your situation is, but we we've got like our company's got so many products, and so we have some that just have absolutely totally sporadic demand. So it's like mm -hmm. you wouldn't really you wouldn't really want to wait, you know, your predictions there as as much as your really reliable ones that yeah are selling a lot every year. So. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, it's nice to when you have a good accuracy on the, the high volume stuff, you at least feel good. It's like, well, our flagship product, we've got a, yeah. a, a seven percent weight in May. It's like, OK, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> of course, no, I mean, we we don't necessarily, but we actually have pretty good made for my company on some of our products, our bigger products. But um, and of course, there's the smaller stuff where it's like uh 70 percent mate it's like not so great <laughs> so yeah but for a lot of those that's really you know the data is so noisy I yeah that, that you can get beyond that so well, yeah, you, i think you were the yeah. one who shared that meme about data in the wild and data. oh yeah yeah, yeah. and my you yeah. know the <laughs> tutorial data set i was looking at a random forest for time series tutorial yesterday mm -hmm. and they they plotted the time series it, i mean even to the naked eye there's clearly a pattern there. You know what I mean? You can right. see like yeah, these like, probably generated and then I, I almost want to be like, here's the time series of some, you know, pharmaceutical yeah. demand, have fun finding it. You know what I mean? Cause it's just oh, like, yeah. if Absolutely. you look at some of this demand, you're like, I, maybe there's something a machine learning algorithm could pick up. But I look at that and I'm like, and eh, it looks kind of mm. like somebody just, uh, you know, randomly, sometimes people buy, sometimes they don't. And, you know, there we go. Yeah, they decide to stock up or they decide exactly. to go with yeah. their competitor that week or, yeah, who knows? So, so yeah, there's kind of a lot to absorb. It's kind of a short chapter, but yeah, it does cover quite a bit. Cool, thanks. Hey, no problem. Yeah, this is good. Thank you. Yeah. So who's next week? We have uh, resampling. Oh, Brandon's up next. Okay, cool. All right. I have to admit, I I I'm gonna have to study this stuff so that maybe I can understand next week. Because, <laughs> like I said, I know the top layers of those uh, of those metrics, but I didn't know any of those other ones. So I'll oh, well, I feel like yeah, most of us uh, in that boat. Yeah, <laughs> this is kind of like. Yeah, I feel like it's be, the further we get into this with some of the, you know, tools for creating effective models, like that's going to be stuff that I'm, you know, just marginally familiar with, but I'm mm -hmm. hoping, you know, presenting will help me kind of get it down, you know, better yeah. and kind of understand what's really going on. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, just getting your hands on, do it, you know, running some of this code and like I say, maybe just kind of trying a different data set or trying a different playing, yeah, playing you know, with approach. It. Is the model the model data is the the package with the alternate data sets? Is that right? 
Yeah. Effort. Okay. I, I was, I thought I might have seen something when you were scrolling, but. Yeah, I, I, that's why I was scrolling because I was like, where was that data? Yeah. This might say. Or no, it doesn't that's say. That's the yard, yeah, yardstick package. Yeah. Well, I can look at it myself. It's fine. I was just, it's uh, sometimes whenever I think, oh, if I want to sample data set, it's like, oh, and then my mind kind of blanks. It's like, what is a good sample data yeah. set? So. Well, there's the UCI uh, machine learning repository. Right? Oh, that's right. And then, like, honestly, sometimes I get data from Kaggle is, is good. They have nice data sets. Yeah, actually, you can see I did this because I was playing around with that Wordle game. So I was like, what's English word frequency? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's word. Wordle. Yeah. Then you find out that, yeah, there's a lot of different data sets that may or may not be useful, depending on the source. Yeah, this is awesome. There's a lot of data. Oh, here's somebody did a, a Wordle. Quirtle. Yeah, Quirtle, I think, is the one that you have to do four at the same time. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. There's, there's an eight one, and there's a bunch of other ones, too. There's math ones. I have yet to dump on the Wordle train. I don't know. I'm just kind of like, eh. but I know a lot of people are really into it. Yeah, so. we got a lot of coworkers. It's fun. Through. It's yeah. short. You oh, know. Hey, look, Wordle valid words. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you can see too many, many people. So this one, 34K, 7K. Yeah. So anyway, you know, there's, there's all kinds of data for people that want to play with data that's Maybe nicer than your life, <laughs> or you know, maybe at a bigger, bigger scale where where you can see the patterns better. Yeah. Speaking of Wordle, I saw a tweet recently. It was Wordle is the sourdough starter of Omicron. Oh, and, that's a good. Uh... <laughs> and, and then somebody like quote tweeted, they're like, "Imagine this telling this to your 2019 self," and it was like, "Yeah, that would sound like gibber people." <laughs> Gibberish, hey, but uh, yeah, now it all makes did, it 2022 it all makes sense <laughs> my wife did the sourdough starter she had to like do it a couple times to get it oh right. yeah you know, that's that true that, that's really a 2020, 2020 trend yeah. isn't it so i guess 2022 will be wordle and quirtle and whatever else mm -hmm. people are doing yeah. in that regard and then hopefully that's the last of our pandemic inspired <laughs> we'll I wish I could be confident in that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I hope so too. I hope. Anywho. Okay. Thanks. Hey, we'll yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank we'll you. See you next Thank week. You. See you next week.